Welcome to Token Theatre Friends. I'm Jose, and today I'm joined by the Magnifica, Irene Lucio, who you might know from Slave Play and Orange Julius, among others. We're going to talk about your incredible year because you've had quite a year, Irene. First thank of all, you. thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Jose. Did you know I'm going to Slave Play for the fourth time tomorrow? I want to hear everything, though, about what it's like to be doing Slave Play, you know, after you've been doing it. So you say it was like New York Theatre Workshop and then you moved to Broadway and what has that transition been like for you? I've actually been with Slave Play since the first reading of Slave Play three years ago wow. when Jeremy was a first year, which is crazy. Um, yeah, uh, they brought in actors from New York to, to Yale for the day to read a new play and they had sent us, they had sent us Slave Play um, and there was still no third act um, and I think <laughs> the second act wasn't totally finished, like can each... One of one of the moments in the second act wasn't um, wasn't there yet, uh, but I remember reading those first two acts and, and immediately going like I'm going to Yale. We're doing this. I definitely want to read this. Um, and me and Shalia actually read the moderators. And according to Jeremy, he sort of knew or discovered that 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 that's what that dynamic was when when he saw us perform it, which is really exciting. Uh, then he did a, 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 perf a show, the first show of it was with students at YSD. And then um, Shalia and I, Annie McNamara and James Cusati Moyer got to do it at the O'Neill. Um, and then, but when we were doing it at the O'Neill, we already knew that there was gonna be a New York Theater Workshop production, but we didn't know we were gonna be in it. Um, so I auditioned for for the New York Theater Workshop production and got it, and then um, and then now we're on Broadway. It's crazy. It's crazy how fast the turnaround was, too. Um, yeah, I feel very fortunate, and it all feels very surreal. But yay, I'm so happy. Because you. you're one of the only Latinas on Broadway right now, which is yeah. insane. It's bonkers. Yeah, yesterday I did a podcast with The Soul Project, um, and it was Arturo, Soria, and I with Jacob Padron and it was like we were basically talking about that like in terms of numbers the the numbers are pretty abysmal of Latinos on Broadway right now mm. I know West Side Story is probably going to help those numbers but I I, I, I don't know fingers we'll crossed see. yeah when I when I saw Slate play on Broadway I don't know why it was the first time probably because it's Broadway and Broadway is super 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 like Caucasian mm -hmm. so it wasn't until I saw Slate play on Broadway that your incredible it all just like struck me like lightning and I felt like seen him. in a play that is you know trying to see so many people and in a play that's so in love with the idea of intersectionality and how we all meet and how you know those meetings sometimes lead to like problems and stuff but yeah. I want to know everything about that pero because like I know it's just one word but I think it's my favorite line in any play this year. <laughs> that makes me so happy to hear. Um, so that line is not in the script. Uh, the there's a it, there, instead of pero there's but it's it's all in English. Um, but my my character is uh, described in the in the character descriptions. It says Patricia is a white passing brown woman that's lived many lives. And um, how do you act <laughs> as lived many lives? <laughs> Particularly with you know with, with what's in the script where <clears throat> this character has to moderate a group of people, um, and uh, I think at the O'Neill already Jeremy and Robert O'Hara got to know me that I, I code shift all the time being a Latina you know like we we code shift when we speak to each other. Oh, I think both. Um, exactly. Okay. <laughs> I speak Spanish with my family. I speak Spanish at home. Um, if, if I have friends that are Latino, we immediately go into Spanglish. Um, and I think they saw me doing it quite a, quite a bunch of times at the O'Neill so that when the audition happened for New York Theater Workshop, they were like, can you do, can you do the thing? Can you do that thing that you do um, when you're like talking to your family <laughs> and stuff? Um, and like choose a moment where you get to do that. And I was like, that's fucking exciting to me. So then um, in the audition kind of I discovered that kernel, like that's how you can show that she has an otherness even though she looks white and sounds white. Um, and then the pero, what I, I added, I, I, uh, I did like this, a Spanglish moment that is not going to be in the script so that it can stay open to all kinds of different interpretations of that role. But, um, but that was my way of putting me and my family into, into that space of, um, 
not only to uh, show that that uh, Patricia is Latina and that she's representing a lot of like white passing Latinos, but also uh, to show the privilege that sometimes uh, white passing brown people can have in choosing when they get to mm. when they get to be brown, when they get to be white, and that in and of itself is a privilege that the black like spectrum of this play does not get to exercise. Mm-hmm. Let me try to see if I have this straight. So you're like part Boricua, Cubana, Española. Um, y Dominicana. Y Dominicana. Yeah. And, and, and I would love for you to talk a little bit about, you know, living in those spaces, because like you went to Ivy League schools, you're on Broadway, but at the same time, when you go to auditions and stuff, people want you to play something that you're not, and sometimes they're disappointed, I guess would be the word, when you're not, you know, when, when you're not either too much of this or too little of that, I mean, and you're just being Irene. So yeah. how do you move in the world as an actor when, you know, your, your name, for instance, means that people are going to expect things that you're not and that you're not interested in, in doing, for that matter? Sure. I mean, I, I, I notice a very stark difference between auditions for television and film versus theater. Um, theater's my background, theater's my, where my training is from, and a lot of actors go into theater in order to transform, so I, I didn't have necessarily like qualms with getting to play people with different backgrounds than mine. It's something I welcome and it's something that I really enjoy. Um, but I will say that the first time I was given a play about a Latino family ever in my entire career was this was right before Slave Play in New York Theater Workshop. I got to do El Huracan by Sharice Castro-Smith at Yale Rep, produced by The Soul Project. And it was the first time that I was actively asked to bring in my ancestors into the space. Mm. So you typically do things like that in order to in order to like create a richness of character, but you're not actively being asked to draw upon your history mm. if if that's not your story, right? If it's that if that's not your specific culture that you're that you're talking about. So um, so it was a big discovery for me to be in a Latino play and be like, wow, I never get to do this because there are not enough Latino plays out there. Um, and, and when there are some, like there, there isn't enough, because there isn't enough, there isn't enough, uh, like different types of Latino stories. Um, we have, we all come from different backgrounds, different countries, different histories, different, you know, so it's, it's so rich and we don't get to draw upon that very often. In TV and film is when I actually come across the whole, like, what are you? Um, because my name is Spanish, and I didn't want... My name can be pronounced in English or in Spanish, but I don't want to be Irene. I am Irene. Like, that's my grandmother's name. Um, so it was very... It was the first time that I was asked to, like, go in for potentially a Caucasian role and then going, but wait, where are you from? Because your name is Spanish, and you just corrected how I said your name. Because they say Irene, and I say, no, it's Irene, and then they'll go, where are you from? And then I'll say Puerto Rico, and they're like, oh, you're Latina. And then I notice that immediately, almost like, a, there's like almost a different lens on the camera. Um, and and that can be very puzzling. It, now, it's starting to change. It's just like changing slowly. There's more roles that are open to all ethnicities. But I also noticed that when it was a role that it was explicitly for a Latina, um... I was deemed to look too white. I was told I looked too white. I looked too educated, I've been told. I looked too sophisticated, I've been told, which is all That's racist. Mean. It's, it's racist. Horrible. It's racist because it's a they're trying to compliment you while also shitting on your culture. So so because I wasn't because I wasn't getting cast as a Latina and I noticed that even the the roles that were open to Latinas seemed limited. They seemed so marginal to the storyline. And if they were in the center, it still felt like I couldn't meet the archetypes. It was still either a hypersexual woman or a very submissive woman. And I couldn't, that's not my, the baseline for me for either. Um, so I met, I met this, this wonderful friend of mine named Emma Ramos, um, who she's from Mexico. She looks, she actually looks more Latina if we, in terms of the stereotype, but she also doesn't meet those two archetypes. And we had conversations about why aren't we getting work? in TV and film, and we realized that we're more like Tina Fey and Amy Poehler, but in the Latino world, and that those those archetypes don't exist yet. So we decided to create a Latina Key and Peele show, at first selfishly, to showcase that we could do many characters um, that weren't being asked upon, up for us to do, but 
But then it became a greater mission of like, oh, let's make fun of these Latino stereotypes on in the media and c- consistently show you that we are underrepresented, that there's so much more to us. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's been great because since creating that web series, I mean, it did really well. It won an NBC comedy award, became viral organically. Um, but since doing that, it's it's made me think of, of my work as part of a mission to cr- expand representation, um, at least for within like the Latinx community. Mm-hmm. But I also, even in Slave Play, I still feel like it's part of that mission to champion underrepresented voices. So let's let's take a look at your show. Do you want to introduce the clip that we're gonna watch? So the clip you're about to watch is called Spanish Class, um, and it actually the genesis was because Emma and I taught Spanish to little kids um, in really wealthy homes and were consistently uh, humiliated by comments that they told us. So we created a revenge film called Spanish Class. I love it. Uh, <laughs> let's begin. Yo me llamo Emma. ¿Y tú? A mí me Timmy. Try again. Uh, me llamo Timmy. Muy bien, Timmy. Muy bien. Lucy! What is this? Oh, I know that. Uh, y- you just said that. Uh, it's not water, oh, it's so. Uh, agua. Not agua. Vaso de agua. It holds the agua. I think this isn't the right method for us. Um, we, 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 we didn't you say you desperately needed to learn Spanish in a week? Well, yes, but... Well, I suggest you sit down! What's your absolute favorite word in Spanish? There's so many. I love I love curse words in Spanish because I think they're so much richer than than so cool. than um, English. Um, like I love the word pendejo. Oof. It yeah. means pubic hair. It is like a really, really gross word. Yeah. Why? <laughs> but it's like it's fun to say, um, mamao, chocha. Like these horrible, <laughs> wonderful words, but like they're just like delightful to like. God, my mom is going to be so mad that I said that word. Like, I love, for instance, that in Spanish, there's a lot of words for I love you that are so specific to different kinds of love. And in English, you just have love. (laughs) And I kind of love that there's so many in Spanish. So I'll say the word love, amor, o sea, because it's te adoro, te amo, te quiero. So there's there's just, I think those are my favorite. So you had a break between Slave Play being at your theater workshop and Slave Play moving to Broadway. Mm -hmm. What happened to you? What were you doing? What shows were you in? I did Lunch Bunch at Club uh, Club Thumb uh, that did really, really well uh, by Sarah Inspanier and directed by Tara Medinejad. And Tara and I went to a high school summer camp together. And we hadn't worked with each other since we were 17. (laughs) So I was very excited to get to work with her. <laughs> um, and it, it's a it's a fantastic uh, piece, and I, I was really drawn to it because um, there's a musicality in the language, and even in the on the page, you can tell that there's like this stick of mythia that's fabulous, and and it's a beautiful ensemble piece. I'm really I love ensemble pieces. I really do. When I was in tech for Lunch Bunch, and it was my birthday, when I got the call from Robert O'Hare and Jeremy O'Harris that we were going to Broadway. Wow. I, they, they told us we were going to Broadway. We can't guarantee you the part just yet. And I remember going, if I get the news on my birthday and I don't get to go on Broadway, that would be the cruelest, cruelest like timing in the world. So I was like, I think I'm going to go. I think I'm going to be on Broadway. I love it. Why did you want to do theater? Oh, God. <laughs> What do you want to be in? I mean, I don't, I think uh, I, I discovered theater very young. Um, I, uh, a wonderful drama teacher from Puerto Rico saw me do a little like school, like a class play. And then she started putting me in the high school musicals. And then in sixth grade, she created a musical where the lead was a middle schooler. And I think it was purposely because she knew that I was going to play that part and she was helping me. Um, So I got to be Annie in the sixth grade in the high school musical. Um, And then Peter Pan the following year. 
And I, I sort of discovered very early that when I was on stage, things sort of aligned in this really strange and cosmic way <laughs> that's very hard to explain. You and I had a conversation about this once. Like, I, it, it is a little bit almost like a, a spiritual feeling of, con- of connectivity um, that happens when I'm on stage. It's very hard to deny. So I tried for a long time, despite knowing that so early, I, I tried for a long time to not be an actor because I didn't like the idea of being chronically unemployed. I still don't. Um, but it didn't work out. Uh, so I, I, did, I went to college and I studied liberal arts uh, and I tried to avoid theater and it ended up working terribly. Um, I got terrible grades, I had to leave school and then I, I took like a semester, I did a semester at Lambda and then everything aligned. I started sleeping better, I started working overtime, I started, I had a lot of energy and I was just thriving. So I went, I went back to Princeton, finished my degree but did a lot of theater. And then I went straight to, I was lucky enough, I went straight to the Yale School of Drama. But then I, that's when I was like, I got I have to do this. I almost had to do it for my health. <laughs> that's so terrible. Yeah, I, I don't think, I do think a lot of these jobs are vocational jobs. You don't, you, you wouldn't put up with half of the things you have to put up with um, if you didn't absolutely love it mm. in, to an, to a, an obsessive way. And now you're like in a play that everyone, even my friend who has like no clue about na 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 in Broadway, he's like, so what's this play, play thing that I've been hearing about? And one of the things that I, you know, I love this play so much. And one of the things that I told to myself the second that it was moving to Broadway is, I am dying to go see it on a Wednesday matinee with all the super old ladies because I want to know what that's going to be like. And Interesting. And I mean, and you do this, what, eight times a week, right? Mm-hmm. And it's one of those plays where, like, we see, you know, stories on, on, online and, like, in the news about, like, reactions that people have to the play. What's it like for you being on that stage and then being with those audiences? Some of, you know, some people are, like, very outspoken about how they feel about the play and some people just, like, flat out adore it. And you have that, like, incredible... Uh, all uh, what was it called? The blackout. blackout. We have another blackout. one January eighth. I'm very excited. Wow. Next blackout January eighth. Go. So yeah. what, what's it like to be doing this play with this audience? I mean, it's it's extraordinary. It, it, it's um, I mean, the first time we did it downtown, there were 200 seats. Now there's 800 seats. You know, so just that is is like it magnifies everything. It heightens everything. Um, I love that this play is bringing in more diverse audiences because it's uh, it's almost like in a sea of people you can see little pockets where people um, are responding and feeling seen, um, in- including like pockets of, of primarily white people, right? Um, and and I sort of love that that they're a character in the play with us, for, particularly because the set sort of makes them so. Um, but it's, it's, it's almost a play within a play, seeing what permission audiences give themselves, you know, of when to respond, when to vocally be able to laugh. Um, I personally love it. I love it even when they're not as vocal because there's, they always surprise you. You don't know how an audience is taking something in. Um, and even though it might feel like they're not giving you the, the vocal energy that you might that might energize you, they might be absorbing it in a very, very deep level. Um, I personally love all of the reactions. I love when, when a reaction is like, no. And somebody goes, no. And I'm just like, yeah. You know? I've gotten a no when I code shift, like she shouldn't be doing that. And I'm like, you don't know me. You don't know who I am. You don't know where I'm from. It's very exciting. Uh, so I, I, I think I love, I love, um, getting getting all of these reactions and I also love that that it's a more vocal audience than most traditional Broadway plays it's giving it's giving space to have a a less traditional less white space experience and and I welcome that we mm. want that luckily you're on Broadway eight nights a week well eight times a week so what do you do when you when you do you have time off and what do you do when you have time off I watched Drag Race yesterday love it love it so much. um I uh, I don't have a lot of time off. 
Uh, I do a lot of resting and I do uh, and I write. So I, I'm, I'm trying to to get more projects with Latinx uh, characters in the center uh, launched because if if you don't write them, they won't exist. Uh, so so you have to be a you have to be a multi hyphenate if you're going to be an artist of color or if you want more representation for people of color. Um, so that's that's what I'm doing right now. Basically, I'm I'm trying to get um, a couple of projects out and and I'm watching Drag Race. I mean, I love it. What's your favorite season? Oh God. It's like Sophie's. Church I did Friday really Sunday. like the Trixie. The, no, not the Trixie. Sorry, the Jinx Monsoon season a lot. Season I really liked season five, um, but I don't even know. I, oh God, the Sasha Velour season was great. I really loved that season because Sasha is my queen because she's sort of like the dramaturg. Uh, she's the <laughs> she's the dramaturg drag queen. That is like always trying to bring in like drag history and stuff. But what I love about that is that she's always sort of carrying her elders with her mm -hmm. and she knows what tradition she comes from and where she wants to go next. And she's still a new queen. Um, I find it so, I find drag so beautiful and so uh, multifaceted in terms of the artistry that's involved. And I find it incredibly um, liberating to see that kind of art out there because then it makes, it makes me feel like I can be bolder. You know, I. This is our last episode of the year. Okay. So thank you for being here. Gracias. I wish I had some champagne now. It's at least I could have done, but anyway, we'll figure that out later. I have a show later. I can't That's remember. a good point. Yeah, don't, don't drink and act. Right? Don't drink and act. <laughs> but, uh, did you have, did you, if you had chance, a chance to go see any shows other than, you know, starting your own show this year, did you have any shows that you loved or any shows that you want to get to see at some point? Yeah, I you really want to get to see one and two. Um... I think it's an important show, and I think it's a show that get, needs to get seen by more people. Um, I I want I want to see is this your room, and I, I I'm gonna get to. Uh, I want to see uh, I want to see the inheritance. Um, I really and I am curious about West Side Story. I'm I'm curious what they're doing with it. Um, Evo Van Hove is always in, like is always going to make an interesting spectacle and, and show. So I'm, I'm curious about that. Um, yeah, and, and this, this sounds, but one of the best things I've ever seen that was incredibly theatrical is the movie Parasite. Mm. It's an incredibly theatrical movie and it's, it, it's one of the best things I've seen all year. Unfortunately, I haven't seen that much theater and, and it's fortunately because I've been working. Um, but I, I, I wish I could have seen Fefu, for instance. Like, I, I haven't gotten to see a Maria Irene Fornes play in a professional stage. I've seen students perform, like Mud, for instance, or scenes, but I have never seen, like, an official professional production. I heard wonderful things about it, and I really wish I could have seen it. It was sublime. I'm sorry, I'm not going to brag about it. No, I know. I know. I'm going to see if there's a way that I can get it, like... A, a video of something because I it, she needs to be produced more and I would love to see a show. See, yeah, see maybe a next show. time they do Fefu, you can be in Fefu, right? Well, we'll see when the next time they do Fefu is. That's part of the problem, isn't it? Be 40 years again. That's that's part of the problem yeah. and that's what we need to fix. Yeah. Oh, man. Now that we've heard from Irene, we have previous guests and theater artists that, that I love who are going to share some of their favorite theater moments of 2019 with us. I can't believe it's the last year in a decade. It's so crazy. Anyway, let's go take a look at that. Alicia Harris here with my favorite piece of theater from 2019 that I got to experience. And that piece for me was A Strange Loop by Michael R. Jackson. Um, within the first few moments of that play, I was yassing to the stage, <laughs> thanks to um, the music and the beautiful choreography by Raja Feather Kelly. I, I found it a very effective piece of theater. I love a call out of a problematic status quo and it was just wonderfully rendered, um, engaging throughout. As a creative, I found it very inspiring and I love that I got to sit and look at 
queer black folks for a good little while in the theater. That doesn't happen often enough. Um, so big love to Michael R. Jackson, big love to everyone who had anything to do with a strange loop. Um, it has stayed with me and I'm really grateful for it. Thank you. Hello everyone, this is Isaac Gomez, Chicago-based playwright broadcasting from the Chicago airport looking a hot mess. Sorry, I just I just landed. Um, I hope I said make it informal, so pues, here we are. It's as informal as it gets, everyone. <clears throat> uh, my favorite theater show of the year. So over the summer, I had a chance. I was working on a play in New York for my first time. And while I was there, um, I happened to to be uh, rehearsing a around the time um, Michael R. Jackson's A Strange Loop was up at Playwrights Horizons. And <clears throat> that play is something I still think about almost every single day. Um, it's one of the first times I've seen like so brilliantly interwoven intersectionalities as it relates to body and race and sexuality and gender um, in really powerful and nuanced and meaningful ways, um, both funny and hauntingly familiar and really sad. Um, <clears throat> I saw it with um, playwright Luis Alfaro and you know, we're both, you know, queens of a certain size and um, it was really meaningful to experience that in that Attention, never yes. before. Oh, here she goes. Just talking. Um, it's illegal to solicit rights from the airport, just so you know. But um, yeah, it, 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 it was mind blowing to the point where when even that, when that, I feel like such a fangirl, even when the album came out, I bought it and then listen to it almost every single day that when Spotify does the year end of like what are you what are you listening to and um at a strange loop was the thing I had listened to the most in 2019 which is just hilarious given that like I only had that album for like a short period of time happy holidays um so I've been thinking about it and I'm sure uh that my favorite show from this past year was ain't no mo by jordan e. cooper and directed by stevie walker webb at the public hi i'm kate hamill and some of my favorite theater moments of 2019 uh i saw so much great stuff this year i thought it was just a great year for theater um really inspiring stuff but two things that jumped right to mind um were i loved Lydia Diamond's Tony Stone at Roundabout, the performances, the play, the direction. I just loved, loved, loved that piece. And um, I just saw Jagged Little Pill and Lauren Patton's You Oughta Know, Holy Crow. I've never been in an audience before um, where the, uh, you know, the whole audience just jumped to their feet and were just screaming um, because it was such an amazing performance of this seminal song. It was like being there when, you know, Barbara Streisand sang Ms. Marmalstein and I can get it for you wholesale. It's like one of those moments that I've read about where people just jump to their feet, but I don't know that I've ever witnessed it. And it was well-deserved because it was pretty mind-blowing. Hi, I'm Madhuri Shaker, and I'm going to talk about uh, my favorite show of the year, although maybe it's hard to pick one, right? But I want to talk about Jacqueline Backhouse's play Wives, which played at Playwrights Horizons. And I found it tremendously moving, funny, sweet, uplifting, um, because it was just this incredible celebration of women helping other women throughout history. And that's what it was. It was just women coming together being good to each other, <laughs> being funny, being acerbic, being sharp, being surprising, and forming communities throughout history. And uh, in the program notes, Jacqueline wrote about how she started writing this play when she was pregnant, and it makes total sense, because nothing shows you the value of the other women in your life. Nothing shows you the value of how important women are to each other 
how women have literally been saving each other's lives for the entirety of our existence than the experience of pregnancy. So I just wanted to give a shout out to that wonderful play. I was so happy to see it. The actors were incredible. It was just a delight. Hi, my name is Daniel K. Isaac, and here are several of my favorite theater moments of 2019 because I couldn't whittle them down to just one. And I wrote them down because I'm terrible at names. So um, in no particular order, but in the order that I saw the shows over the course of the year, God Said This by Leah Nanako Winkler. I'd never seen a Asian, Asian American mother uh, struggling with cancer, which is something that I could personally relate to, and I've never cried start to finish in a show um, than in that show. I have to go faster. Infinite Love Party by Diana O oh at the Bushwick Star, Nassim by Nassim Soleimanpour at MTC, um, also about parent-child relationships and when he calls his mom, again, lost it. Suicide Forest at Bushwick Star by Haruna Lee, also parent-child things. I have a recurring theme here. Mary Seacole at LCT3. Quincy Tyler Bernstein's performance was hands down one of the most incredible things this year. Plano by Will Arbery at Club Thumb. The relationship of the sisters was unparalleled. Ain't No Mo by Jordan E. Cooper. He's a star. Curse of the Starving Class at Signature Theater, the opening moments of the play directed by Terry Kinney, where the set broke apart. I've never seen anything like that. A visual memory I'll always hold with me. Lunch Butch at Club Thumb by Sarah Einspinier, that um, ensemble work, office chairs, everyone, perfection. It's coming back, go see it. A Strange Loop, Michael R. Jackson. I don't have favorites, I don't like saying favorites, but I will say I saw that show three times, so that is that Hades Town when the lamps swung over the audience and when we descended into Hades, those are theatrical uh, moments that I'll never forget. What the Constitution Means to Me, I saw it at Club Thumb, I saw it at New York Theatre Workshop, and I got to see it again on Broadway. Heidi Schreck is my idol and makes the world a better place. Soft Power at the, Hup at the Public by David Henry Huang. The last song made me feel so seen as an Asian American and an API performer and just a human being in America today. Um, History of Violence at St. Anne's Warehouse uh, by Edouard Luis. The, the tension and, um, oh, the tension. That's all I have to say. Fefu and her friends at Tefana, Maria Aren Fornes, uh, the women, and then moving around, and the revelation of space in which the floor opened up, just, so incredible. Please bring that show back. Uh, Greater Clements by Samuel D. Hunter at uh, Lincoln Center. Um, I loved the set that moved up and down. And then the scene in part three in the mine. I just, without spoilers, that, uh, that really got me. Um, and then tonight I just saw Judgment Day at the Armory, um, directed by Richard Jones. And just to get to see scale and just huge scope played with with a traditional play. Um, it's so exciting to see theater like that. So yeah, thanks for asking and um, keep going to see theater in 2020. Happy holidays. Hey Jose, uh, thanks for asking me to do this. Um, I'm wearing my coat because uh, it's Los Angeles, so it's, it's kind of cold, like 60 degrees, so sorry. <laughs> Anyways, uh, theater, uh, easily top of the list is Strange Loop, man. I loved, loved, loved that show. It was just phenomenal and original. And uh, um, I think uh, we're all looking for our inner white girl. <laughs> uh, in DC, uh, I got to co-direct a play uh, called uh, Columbinus with Alex Levy over at First Stage in Tyson's Corner with a great cast uh, just to watch them just do hard work each night was just fantastic. Uh, I also got to see a Dominique Morisot play in DC that was phenomenal, just a small non-union theater over there. Uh, I wish I could have seen plays like um, Slave Play. Uh, yes, even Inheritance. I know you have a lot going on with that, but just to experience it and get an idea of what's going on. Uh, here in Los Angeles, uh, it was 
a treat to watch two Stephen Alley Gerges plays as a New Yorker. It was just an amazing time uh, to do it. You let her in. Where do you let her in? Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's just my, our cat who's coming in. Come here, buddy. No, oh, it's okay. How are you doing? See, it's, it's Leroy. He might lose his shit in here. <laughs> so, uh, Motherfucker with a Hat by, uh, I think it's Urban Theater Movement or Urban Movement. Sorry, guys. It was fantastic. Uh, Between Riverside and Crazy over at the Fountain Theater was a treat. Um, yeah. Uh, that was Leroy. Leroy Jenkins, Leroy Brown. He's a Harlem cat. Uh, and then I, I wish I could see... Um, Halfway Bitches Go to Heaven over at the Atlantic and a co-production with Labyrinth Theater in New York City with a lot of friends over there and colleagues. Uh, and I wish I could be there uh, for that. There are so many things about theater that I love this year, especially in New York, uh, from unexpected plays going to Broadway to A Strange Loop at Playwrights Horizons and Page 73. I love Charlie Yvonne Simpson's debut at Ensemble Studio Theater and Eli Gelb's performance in Skin Type particularly. He just really blew me away. But if I'm being totally honest, uh, in terms of theatrical experience, just from leaving my apartment to to curtain at the theater. Uh, my personal highlight was uh, eating a weed gummy and going to see The Lion King on Broadway for the first time. I'm not joking, it changed my life. My favorite um, theatrical experience of 2019 uh, was um, Mojada by Luis Alfaro, based on the Greek tragedy, um, Medea by Euripides. Um, as an immigrant myself, um, I was very moved because this is the kind of stories I'm um, very interested to tell, but also I I get excited when I know that someone is uh, approaching these kind of stories in a, like an immigrant stories. Um, so I remember like sitting in the theater and watching that long sequence about um, Medea crossing the border. And I was um, just uh, shocked and uh, crying and sobbing the whole time because I actually know a lot of people um, who have lived that experience, like crossing the border, like crossing the river, or um, crossing by a car with a coyote or uh, by an airplane, but just um, having uh, taking the risk to do that, being um, in the theater and seeing that in a theatrical way was for me like very, very, very powerful. And um, all the struggle that we as immigrants um, faced in a, in a new country, uh, everything was 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 in there, of course, like taking a. Uh, Taking to uh, going to the very dramatic ending, right? Uh, but at, uh, but in some way, um, we always face uh, to take those decisions, to take decisions during our immigrant journey. Um, in this case, that was Medea's, Medea's decision. But we, as a, as an immigrant, uh, we take decisions every single day about how we want to live in this country and. Um, um, to see an immigrant uh, experience on stage um, by, like, written by Luis Alfaro in this very masterful way, um, it was very, very moving for me. Um, and I'm looking forward to see more uh, diverse theater in um, 2020 and hopefully to be part of the theater as well. Hi, Jose. It's Chantal. Um, you asked me to tell you what my favorite theater experience was. Well, I just came out of 140 Pounds, which is Susan Liu's uh, one-woman self-produced show, and it was fucking amazing. So this might be my top one. Also, seeing Slave Play and seeing uh, Freestyle Love Supreme this year was epic because it's very rare to see that much representation on stage, and those are my most exciting moments. Bye! 
my favorite show of the year was Michael R. Jackson's A Strange Loop. Um, I absolutely loved it. Um, I cried through a lot of it, and um, uh, I just thought that that show had um, some of the strongest performances I've ever seen in any show ever. Um, the writing is amazing. It's so honest. It's so him, and um, you can just see the years of, of work um, and uh, dedication that went into making that show. And um, yeah, I just, I just thought it was fantastic. One of the beautiful things about um, this theater season was at the beginning of the season, Donye Love made a list of all the Black theater happening at the time. And there were so many shows on that list, many of which the writers were making their New York debuts like myself. And it reminded me that this business tries to feed you the lie that you have to knock somebody else out the way in order for you to succeed. And this theater season blew that theory out the water. It reminded us that we can love on each other, celebrate each other, and there is room for all of our stories to get told. And my biggest hope is that this is not a trend, but that this is a way of life for the American theater, and that it is a way of life not just for the Black theater community, but for all marginalized communities of color to get their stories told. It makes the American theater that much richer, and quite frankly, it's the American theater I want to be a part of. Since it's the last episode of the year, and therefore the last episode of the decade for us, what are some of your resolutions for next year? Boundaries. 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 Um, I grew up in a Latino household. We don't know them. We don't know what they are. <laughs> And, and I'm learning that they're necessary for longevity. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had to and block, survival. I had to block my parents from Instagram, so I know where I, I, yo te entiendo todo. You are heard, you are affirmed, and I see you, which is a line <laughs> from the play. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Boundaries are, are, are key, and I'm trying to figure out how to, how to do them. And just to be a little less uh, apologetic about be, being myself and put, putting work out there. You're fabulous. So, so are you. What's your resolution? Oh, God, I don't know. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I'll think about it later. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you like to invite our viewers and our listeners to come see Slave Play and to see your show also, your web series? Absolutely. Um, please come see Slay. See, blah, blah, let me do it again. <laughs> please come see Slave Play. We're on till January 19th. And Butts the Web Series on YouTube. B U T S Web Series. Irene, un placer. Felices fiestas. Muchas gracias. Felices fiestas. Mm-hmm. Y feliz año nuevo. Para ti también. Y recuerda, el teatro es más entretenido si llevas a un amigo, especialmente uno fabuloso como Irene. Bye bye. Okay.